Good evening. Can you hear me, Connor, all right? Wonderful. Good evening and welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Michael Reardon. I have the privilege of serving as the president of the library company, having succeeded my dear friend, Hal Rosenberg. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank Hal for his more than decade of service and continuing service for the library company. I'm really pleased that you're here, and I understand we have a virtual audience as well, uh, to this evening's 10th annual lecture in honor of our esteemed colleague, John Van Horn. Um, we are really, really fortunate to have with us today a preeminent scholar of American history, Alan Taylor. You'll hear from him shortly. I want to say a few words of thanks first and give a little bit of a background about the library company to those of you who may be new to it. First, I want to thank our friends at the American Philosophical Society. With us, uh, I believe, Bob Hauser, who is the president, Michelle McDonnell, who is the director of the Library and Museum. Uh, we really appreciate host, uh, being able to host the event here. This is a special, special hall named after our common founder, uh, the in inimitable Dr. Franklin. Dr. Franklin founded the American Philosophical Society and the Library Company, essentially for the same common purpose, and that was to improve society through the advancement of knowledge. A fairly basic concept, um, one that I think we sorely need today, but that's a separate discussion. <laughs> I am confident, um, I had the pleasure with uh, a group today to have lunch with Alan Taylor, and uh, I am very, very confident that he will fulfill that mission of Dr. Franklin and advance our knowledge about a critical period, not only in American history, but in the continental history. Um, I also want to thank um, the staff of the Philosophical Society and the Library Company, who have really done all the preparations to make uh, this a wonderful evening. So I thank all of them. Thank you for that. Um, we we um, can only do what we do because of the hard work of many people who go nameless and faceless, and uh, we're indebted to them. We greatly appreciate it, and anything we do is a product of their efforts. Um, I want to speak briefly about the library company, for those of you who are new. Um, this is really a wonderful inter institution that I was in introduced to a few years ago. It's among America's earliest libraries founded in 1731 by Dr. Franklin and members of his intellectual cir circle. He hoped to improve society through the advancement of knowledge and part of his goal was to collect books and other pieces of knowledge, you know, uh, repositories of knowledge, not only for scholars but for tradespeople, farmers and others so that they could gain the knowledge to participate constructively and positively in society. Um, and over the years, that collection that started with the 40 shillings each of the, the members has grown to over 500,000 books. 250,000 of them are rare. Uh, and other um, artifacts of American history that include a world-class uh, collection of African-American history and women's history. Uh, we are very, very proud of all the donations and the work that is going to collecting them, digitizing them, and making them available to the public and um, scholars. A lot of that has been through the work of John Van Horn and his beloved wife, Chris, who have done a lot of the things that I'll talk about briefly that have made that possible, and that's why we honor John. The library company eventually gained, uh, and, and perhaps John with his writing with Professor Green uh, really brought this to fore, the name or the moniker, the Delegates Library, and for good reason. It was the library, it is the library that the delegates to the First and Second Continental Congress came to do the research. It's the library that Madison and others during the Constitutional Convention came in 1787. It was their resource uh, that they drew upon to write the Constitution, uh, one of the most remarkable documents in the history of the world. Um, and we're proud that we played a role uh, our predecessors in making that collection available. Um, 
as we approach the 300th anniversary, the mission of the library company as an independent research library remains the same. It's to foster scholarship and advance knowledge of American history. Uh, the part of it is for the study and the, and the scholarship and, and that work. But at the end of the day, it's to advance knowledge, as Dr. Franklin thought, because uh, it is that history, uh, and you will find this, uh, and I commend to you highly, reading Professor Taylor's most recent book, because it will be remarkable as, and I know he will speak about this far more eloquently than I, but it is that history of that critical period of the Civil War in American history that is so relevant today. And as that saying goes of Satiano, those who don't know that history are doomed to repeat it. Um, in addition to the outstanding work our team does to make those collections available on site to scholars and members of the public, we also, with our staff and scholars and fellows, offer programs, exhibitions, online resources, and public programs and lectures, such as this 10th annual uh, lecture in honor of John Van Horn. There's much more that I could say about the library company, but you are here to hear Professor Taylor and not me. Um, I want to speak briefly about John Van Horn. Um, I'm reminded a little bit, and I'll say this at the beginning, um, I'm a baseball fan, and famously at the funeral, not that this is John's funeral, but at the funeral of <laughs> Lou Gehrig, the uh, celebrant, eulogy was succinct and sublime. He said, you all know him, what more can I add? That could be said of John Van Horn. He's one of the most remarkable people I've had the pleasure to meet. Uh, he's a brilliant scholar. He's an incredible manager. Uh, his attention to detail is um, second to no one else I've ever met. He's in that class of people. Uh, his devotion to the library company, along with his wife, Chris, has made the library company what it has been. Um, and I'll review that briefly. John graduated uh, from Princeton and then went on to gain his PhD at the University of Virginia. And in the period from 1985 to 2014, John served as the director of the library company. In that period of time, and this is just a succinct summary, he established the research fellowship program. He oversaw the digitization of the library catalogs. He transformed the Cassatt House into a scholarship resident, residence, and along with his wife, Chris, um, provided the leadership and the support to build the endowment. Uh, John, in addition to that, in his spare time, has published uh, prodigiously articles and books, including about Benjamin Henry Latrobe. Um, when John stepped down in 2014 in recognition of his wonderful service, he was uh, the board named John, Director Emeritus. I think John thought that that might have been the end, but uh, that, was not, <laughs> that was not to be. Um, no good deed goes unplenished. Uh, last fall, when the need arose and we approached John uh, with the healthy support of Chris, he agreed to come back and serve pro, pro bono, and he has done so. And I've had the pleasure to participate with him, among others, and it has been a tour de force. John has pushed every button imaginable to make the library company better. Um, he's been a wonderful leader and mentor to the staff. He's been a great uh, voice in board meetings. Uh, he has helped uh, raise funds. Um, there is nothing he hasn't done and done uh, par excellence. Um, so we are very, very grateful for, what, for that. I, I say this without, I, I, I don't think it's exaggeration to say in the history of the library company with a possible, you know, after Franklin, given that he created it, I don't think there is anyone in the history as I know it who has been more impactful on the library company than John Van Horn. And I think, I think John would be the first to say that none of that would have happened without his beloved wife, Chris. And I thank you immensely. So next, I'd like to just briefly, um, another person hard to introduce succinctly, but 
his uh, presentation will speak volumes that I, I need not. I want to turn to our guest of honor. I am really honored and grateful to introduce to you one of our nation's most accomplished and pro uh, prolific scholars and authors of American history, Professor Alan Taylor. We are really thrilled to have him here today. I finished his book this morning, and uh, I, I can't tell you how, how good a book it is and, and how compelling, uh, particularly in this time. Um, Professor Taylor is a graduate of Colby College and Brandeis University. He has taught at uh, Boston University and University of California at Davis. He currently serves as a Thomas Jefferson Foundation Professor of History at the University of Virginia. His esteemed career has taken him many places, in, including, fortunately for us, the library company, where he has come back uh, now for his, uh, I think, third time. He was first as a research fellow early in his career. Later, he was a, a speechered, uh, the featured speaker at our 2017 annual dinner, and he is back with us tonight. Among his many accomplishments, he has won two Pulitzer Prizes, uh, which puts him in a class of very, very few people. Uh, first in 1996 for Willard, William Cooper's Town, Power and Persuasion on the Frontier of the Early American Republic, his second in 2014 for the etern internal enemy. Uh, we have invited him to speak tonight about his latest book, American Civil Wars, A Continental History of the United States, 1850 to 1873. It is really a fast-paced narrative of um, a, an amazing period in history. It's soaring ideals juxtaposed with sordid politics, a brutal, brutal civil war, uh, the issues of slavery, emancipation, and then the battles to um, maintain emancipation and the freedom for blacks uh, and all the obstacles, including, you know, the KKK and the like. Just a um, amazing history, and he examines it through the lens not just of what was happening in the United States, but also in Canada and Mexico as all three countries transformed into nations uh, through the crucible of the conflicts that occurred in that period. So please, without further ado, join me in giving Professor Taylor a warm welcome. Thank you, Michael, for that very generous uh, introduction. It was a great pleasure. I met Michael today at lunch, a lunch that Hal Rosenberg hosted, and gives me an opportunity to thank Hal again. Uh, and I want to thank Connor Feeney for all of his hard work in arranging this. And uh, it's a great honor to be asked to speak uh, in a lecture that is named after John Van Horn, who has been one of the great um, scholarly leaders of this generation. And I want to thank whoever arranged the weather today. <laughs> you did, okay. <laughs> well, now I have a complaint with you because it was hard for me to work on my talk today. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not used to this in Philadelphia. I generally come here in the summer. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, this gentleman may look familiar to you, but you're saying, where's the beard? Um, so this is what Abraham Lincoln looked like in uh, January of 1865. He was president-elect of the United States, and he was an elect of a country that's falling apart. So Michael mentioned that my book is very relevant. I wish it was less relevant um, today. Uh, but, but Lincoln, as president-elect, received a lot of different people in Springfield that were coming to seek favors or offer advice. Uh, he is a magnet for people. And they... What am I doing wrong here? Let's see if this does this. Does that work for this? Let's see if this will work. Yeah, okay. Got the technological glitch out of the way early. Uh, so uh, one of his visitors, the man on the left, his name is Matthias Romero. 
Now, Matthias Romero may be familiar to some of you, but he ordinarily does not appear in uh, books about the American Civil War. Um, and the book that I've written is about more than the American Civil War. It's uh, American Civil Wars plural because there was a civil war in Mexico at the same time, approximately the same time. And there was a very uh, real fear in Canada that uh, Canada would be caught up in the American Civil War or perhaps they would have their own that would be along linguistic cultural lines because there were great tensions between Francophone and Anglophone Canada at that time. I want to reassure you there will be nothing on Canada in my presentation tonight. <laughs> uh, so, but there's going to be a lot on Mexico. This is going to primarily be about Mexico's entanglement uh, in events in North America with the United States. And the man on the right is Benito Juarez. Uh, and Juarez was the president of Mexico. And he is a, a leader, the leader of the Liberal Party. Um, to make things quite clear, the two parties in Mexico were the conservatives and the liberals. And the Liberal Party was committed to principles of liberalism, uh, including elected government, written constitution, following the laws. And Juarez is a veteran lawyer, he is a constitutionalist, and he's very committed to defending these institutions that are relatively new in Mexico at the time that he is president. Uh, and, uh, but very embattled because he has just survived a civil war that broke out in 1857 within Mexico with the conservatives. And so when Romero shows up uh, in Springfield, he's coming from a country that's just exited a civil war to a country that's on the verge of its own civil war, the United States. And he needs to cultivate the United States because the United States is a much more powerful country than Mexico the neighbor of Mexico, and a country that just a few years before had invaded Mexico, uh, had occupied Mexico City, and had stripped away 40% of Mexico's territory to add to the United States, including California. So Romero is very much hoping that this new president-elect is going to be uh, much more favorable toward Mexico than had been the case under the preceding democratic administrations, which had been committed to a very aggressive expansion at the expense of Mexico. And so Romero's making his pitch to Lincoln, which is he's seeking a policy that is, quote, truly fraternal and not guided by the egotistic and anti-humanitarian principles of the democratic administrations that had pillaged Mexico of, quote, territory in order to extend slavery. Quote. And he, he found Lincoln very responsive. He found Lincoln to be, quote, a simple, honorable man. But he also noted that Lincoln was preoccupied with his own crisis in his own country and really could do nothing for Mexico. But at the time, it looked like the United States was the country that was in real trouble because it was. Now, these men are holding the Constitution of 1857. This is the Constitution that Juarez had helped to write and which he had defended in the Civil War that had just terminated in Mexico. And the case I want to make in this book is that the American Civil War is not just an American national story. It's a global story with high stakes, global stakes. This is the wake of failed Republican revolutions in Europe that had been crushed in 1848. And thousands of European refugees have come to the United States looking upon it as the last refuge of liberal Republicanism. And Mexico has just succeeded in weathering this conservative reaction that was seeking to, es to establish essentially a centralized dictatorship. So th both in Mexico and in the United States, Juarez and Lincoln and Romero see each other as kindred spirits. They see each other as defending the principles of liberalism, which meant equal individual rights 
It meant market economies, a commitment to social mobility, and a commitment to free elections, written laws, constitutions, so legalism, and a federal union, two different countries, but both of them committed to a federal union that would coordinate the states. But all three of these principles are imperiled. They've been imperiled by the conservative revolt in Mexico, and now they're imperiled in the United States by the Confederate secession from the Union. Now, while Romero saw common cause with the Republicans, the Republicans are actually a very diverse party, and there are some very conservative elements in them. And the principles of liberalism um, were also tainted in the United States, frankly, by white supremacy, which was rampant and could be found among the Republicans as well as among the Democrats. So this man is Edward Bates. He is the new Attorney General of the United States. And he expresses a very common perspective on Mexico at the time. The country was too chaotic, too Catholic, too poor, and above all, too racially mixed in its population in order to be a partner of the United States. And he expresses that very vividly. Now, in early 1862, it also turns out that the Republicans, what they really want out of Mexico is to take some more land away from Mexico. Uh, and the particular land they have in mind is the island of Cozumel and the adjoining coast of Yucatan. Now, they do not want this to set up club meds. <laughs> what they want to do is relocate American blacks there. Now, why in early 1862 is the Republican Party pushing for this? Uh, they are anticipating there's going to be an election in the fall of 1862. And in an American white male electorate, uh, they are feeling sensitive that the Democrats are going to attack them on issues of race. That they are going to attack them for essentially, by disrupting the Confederacy, that they are going to unleash thousands of blacks to move north. And so what the Republicans want is to say, relax. They're not coming north. We're going to put them in Cozumel and Yucatan. <laughs> but in order to do that, they have to approach Mexico and get Mexico's blessing for this. One of the men who's pitching this is the Postmaster General Montgomery Blair, another conservative Republican. He approaches Romero. And he makes uh, this case, which is, and it's a common case that you find among uh, conservative Americans at that time, which is that uh, the tropics will be occupied by what they call Negroes. Uh, and therefore, the best place to push American blacks is southward into a tropical zone in order to whiten America. And so Blair is saying this to Romero, who records this. And Thomas Corwin, he is the American ambassador to Mexico, and he's making a similar case. But he's trying to appeal to the fact that Mexico is actually more committed, at least in principle, to racial equality than is the United States. So he's saying the, they're the only people of the white race known to us willing to treat the black man and woman on a footing of perfect equality. So when he's saying this, implicit in that is, Americans don't feel that way. And that's why we want to get rid of our black people, or at least enough of them, to reassure the American voter that they should vote for Republicans in the fall of 1862. Now, as you might imagine, Romero is put on the spot by this, because he and the Juarez government cannot afford to give up another inch of Mexican land. A liberal government had negotiated the peace treaty that had given up 40% of Mexico in order to end the war in 1848. And the conservative party in Mexico had been hammering them for that. The last thing they want to do is give up another inch of their territory. On the other hand, they need good relations with the Lincoln administration in the United States. But Romero makes it quite clear that they cannot give up any land to the United States. And so the Lincoln administration moves on to an island off of Haiti, Yildavash. 
And there they would relocate just 500 American blacks who would suffer severely in this fiasco before they ultimately would be evacuated. But the initial plan was to send them to Cozumel. So Romero makes it quite clear that American blacks were welcome to move to Mexico, but they would be Mexican citizens, not American colonists. And then this man gets involved to stir up trouble. Uh, this is Napoleon III. He's the nephew of Napoleon I. And let's just say he's got a Napoleon complex. Um, he would love to measure up to his uncle uh, by building an empire. But he's savvy enough to know that building it in Europe is not going to work. So he's trying in Algeria. He's trying in what we now call Vietnam. And he's going to try in Latin America. And he sees his opportunity in Mexico. The pretext is that Mexico allegedly owes a lot of money to French bankers. That's the pretext. What he, Napoleon really wants to do is to install a puppet government in Mexico that will be responsive to France, will open up Mexico to French trade, and will become a place for which French influence then will spread throughout Latin America and render all of Latin America as a set of dependents on France. So that's the vision. And the first target is Veracruz, which is the great port on uh, the Caribbean coast of Mexico. And uh, French troops will occupy it in early 1862 and then proceed to push inland with their target of Mexico City. And the goal is to topple the Juarez government, put in a conservative regime, and then have that conservative regime invite a European to come and be the emperor of Mexico, and a monarch that would be approved by France. Now, this is all very inconvenient for the Lincoln administration. They got their hands full with this war against the Confederacy. It's not going very well in early 1862. They're committed to the Monroe Doctrine, which says that there should be no European meddling against Republican governments within the Americas. And here there is a direct violation of the Monroe Doctrine. What will the Lincoln administration do? Well, the point person is William H. Seward, who is the Secretary of State. Now, at the very start of the Civil War, Seward had had a provocative proposal that the United States should declare war on France uh, as a way to draw the southern states back into the Union, that if you have a common war, then maybe they'll forget this whole Confederacy thing. Well, Lincoln thought, privately, that's nuts. <laughs> They're not going to do that. And he politely makes it clear to Seward that Seward is not the president and Lincoln is. Now, fortunately, Seward gets the message, and he becomes a much more deferential Secretary of State than it ever seemed likely he would be in 1861. And in 1862, he reaches this sensible position, which is whatever we might like to think about the Monroe Doctrine, we're, we don't have the capacity to enforce it right now. So that will become his key position. And he's also very concerned. He does not want France to get involved in the American Civil War. There's a very real danger that French troops and, and French warships would interfere, uh, perhaps in partnership with the British. And Seward wants to head that off. So he makes it quite clear through back channels that the United States would not interfere with what Napoleon was up to in Mexico if Napoleon would not interfere in the American Civil War. Now, this comes as very grim news to the liberal leaders of Mexico who had looked on the United States as, at last, an ally. A Mexican leader noted, quote, we should not fool ourselves. We are alone, completely alone. 
But surprisingly, they win the first big battle when French forces are going into the interior, bound to Mexico City, they're stopped at a place called Puebla. And this is on May 5th, 1862. So if you're ever drinking a cerveza on Cinco de Mayo, you should know that it's this particular battle where the Mexican liberals defeated the conservatives and the French invading force. But this just postpones the inevitable for a year. In May of 1863, the French army would sweep into Mexico City and would install a conservative regime while the Juarez administration becomes a refugee government moving into northern Mexico. The conservatives sent a delegation, it's shown here on the right, uh, to Austria. And they are calling on this man on the left named Maximilian, who had been selected by Napoleon Napoleon decided that he could not put in a French person as the emperor of Mexico, and it, for diplomatic reasons, it was convenient for Napoleon to have Maximilian as his pawn. Now, Maximilian is delusional enough to think that he's not going to be Napoleon's pawn, but he cannot maintain himself in power in Mexico without French money and without French troops as he will painfully find out. Maximilian is on the left. Uh, the woman on the right is his empress, uh, Carlotta, and they are a team. They're a formidable team entirely because of Carlotta. Uh, Maximilian is a lightweight. Uh, Carlotta is a person of formidable intellect and will. And as long as she's heavily involved, Maximilian has a fighting chance in Mexico. Now, as of the time that Maximilian gets installed as the emperor of Mexico, which doesn't happen until the spring of 1864, the blue area shows the area controlled by French troops um, with the support of conservatives. And the liberals are hanging on as a guerrilla movement in uh, the southern states of Mexico and also in the northern states. But if you cut forward by another year, uh, at that point, Juarez is reduced to just an enclave near El Paso, Texas. And it, largely the liberal movement survives um, because of Juarez and his, um, his refusal to submit and his extraordinary dignity under great duress. Uh, and then also the guerrilla movement, which pins down so many French troops, particularly in the South. Now, Romero is trying desperately within the United States to change the American policy, to make it more activist within Mexico. And he's getting nowhere with Seward, so he does an end run. He appeals to the radical Republicans who share his criticism of Seward as a temporizer. And so, for example, Thaddeus Stevens, congressman from Pennsylvania, leading radical in the House of Representatives, he clearly subscribes to the perspective of Romero and Juarez that the struggle in Mexico is part of the same struggle that's going on in the United States. That they're not two separate civil wars, but they are two different faces of the same civil war, which is a struggle for liberal republicanism, on the one hand, against forms of reaction slaveholder confederacy in the south and the imposition of a European monarchy in Mexico are seen as a common struggle by people like Thaddeus Stevens and by this man also doesn't look familiar to you because he's not wearing a beard uh, this is Ulysses S. Grant now I I put this in here because this shows him during the Mexican War when he was an officer in the United States Army, part of the invasion force in Mexico. This is an experience that haunts him throughout his life. He hated the war in Mexico. He hated the uh, James K. Polk administration for having provoked this war. And he nurtures, uh, years later, a desire to try to do something right by Mexico uh, in order to correct what he had been part of 
back in the late 1840s. In July of 1864, Grant had a pointed conversation with Seward, and he says this to Seward, that reestablishing the Juarez government in Mexico has to be part of our struggle in the United States. Can't separate the two the way you're doing. But Seward is unmoving. And he says, yes, we want to get Napoleon out of Mexico, but we don't want any war over it. We have certainly had enough of war. And Lincoln supports Seward's position. So Romero's not really getting very far. He gets Congress to pass a resolution denouncing Maximilian and the French intervention in Mexico, but it has no teeth. Things will change, however, in April of 1865 for a number of reasons. One is Grant ends up forcing the surrender of Lee's army at Appomattox. Second, Lincoln is assassinated. And at the same time, the same group of assassins target Seward and severely wound him. So this is a medal that's issued to the man who intervenes and saves Seward's life, but not after Seward has been severely stabbed several times. So Seward is incapacitated. And there's this new president who's in way over his head, Andrew Johnson. Uh, and, and Grant means to influence Johnson in favor of using this massive Union army that's now triumphant in the South to intervene in Mexico. May 23rd to 24th, there's a big parade in Washington, D.C. It's called the Grand Review. 100,000 spectators turn out for this. Many Union regiments are marching. Uh, top Union generals are almost all there, except for this man, Philip Sheridan. And that was odd, because Sheridan had been quite essential to the Union triumph over Lee that had led to the surrender at Appomattox. And Sheridan's not a bashful guy. He wants to be there. But Sheridan had received a week earlier secret orders from Grant. Grant had not consulted President Johnson about this, but had told Sheridan, sorry, you can't go to the parade. You're going to Texas. Now, why is Sheridan being sent to Texas? Because there's still a Confederate army intact in Texas. And Grant's great fear in May of 1865 is that the Confederacy will rally in Texas, will get active support from Maximilian's empire, and that this civil war will go on. That the civil war is not over with Appomattox as Grant sees it. He's not the only one to feel that way. Sheridan feels that way. And so this is what Sheridan has to say, that this is what Grant tells him in their secret meeting a week before the Grand Review. Now this this set of orders doesn't just come out of nowhere with Grant. It comes out of because he's been cooperating with Romero. They've had a set of secret meetings to hatch what exactly are we going to do now that we have this massive Union army, what can be done. And Grant really wants to send Union troops beyond Texas into Mexico. Uh, and Romero and Grant had their most important meeting. They left Washington. They came here to Philadelphia so that they would be beyond a lot of prying eyes to hash this out. And it's the day after their meeting here in Philadelphia that Grant issues his orders to Sheridan to go to Texas. And in Texas, he's dealing with this man, he thinks. This is Kirby Smith. He is the Confederate commander in Texas. Texas has been kind of isolated from the rest of the Confederacy ever since the Union capture of Vicksburg in July of 1863. So Kirby Smith is something of a generalissimo for the Confederacy in Texas. But he's got a major problem, which is his troops find out about Appomattox. He tried to keep Appomattox secret, okay, as if you could do that. They find out about Appomattox, and they decide they don't want to die for a lost cause. And they just massively desert and loot the government warehouses and go home. 
So Kirby Smith issues this proclamation, basically very sour grapes, that his army has just dissolved on him. So Sheridan really doesn't have to do anything. Now, Kirby Smith is now without an army, but he decides what he's doing is he's going to Mexico. He goes to Mexico. He uh, announces to Maximilian, I'm here. I'm not just here as a civilian anymore. I'm here because I'm going to bring you 19,000 Confederate soldiers, and we want a base to operate so we can continue this war into the American South. So just what Grant feared, Kirby Smith wants to do. And they've been classmates at West Point. Now, Kirby Smith turns out to be grossly exaggerating the number of Confederates who were willing and able to go to Mexico. Point of fact, that summer only 2,000 Confederates do go, not 19,000. They find it very dangerous, very expensive to make this long trip across Texas into northern Mexico, which is a very dangerous place. A lot of guerrillas. And some of those guerrillas then attacked a party of Confederates, and they killed a former Confederate general and his staff and a former Confederate congressman who had been with them. So it's, this is pretty daunting to a lot of people who just decide going home and trying to rescue the farm from the wreckage of the Civil War is a better idea than going to Mexico. The alternative is to go by sea. And this man, Jubal Early, goes by sea. You go down to Havana and then over to Veracruz. But still, only about 2,000 Confederates will do this. Now, Jeb Jubal Early gets there, and one of the really disillusioning things is these Confederates initially hope that they're going to rally a military cause within Mexico, but Maximilian puts a stop to that. Because Maximilian is hoping that he's going to preserve a relatively good understanding with the Johnson administration in the United States. So he forces these Confederates to stand down. But he does appoint this man, a former Confederate officer, naval officer named Matthew Mowry, to um, be the commissioner for immigration. And his job is to actively promote immigration from the American South into Mexico. And he works really hard at it, and he gets another 3,000 to come. So why don't more go? Because at this point, Maximilian's offering financial incentives, tax relief, and even a quasi form of slavery known as apprenticeships. Uh, but none of that is sufficient to attract a substantial number of Confederates. And the primary reason is they just see the Maximilian regime is now doomed that it cannot survive, that it had been created in this hothouse environment when the Union had been preoccupied by its war against the Confederacy. And now that that war is over, most people quite rightly assume there is no future for Maximilian and the conservative cause in Mexico. One of them is William M. Gwynn, former senator from California, Confederate sympathizer, originally from Mississippi, Went back to Mississippi, then goes to France, goes to Mexico. He's hoping to create a colony of Confederates in northern Mexico. But he gets to Mexico City, and he finds out there's just despair among the conservatives and a giddiness among the liberals that the game is just about up. And that conviction leads Gwyn to decide he's going to give up. He goes back to the United States, goes to New Orleans, and surrenders himself to federal authorities. So, Sheridan shows up in Texas. He's got no Confederates to fight, but Sheridan doesn't like to not have an enemy. So he goes to the Rio Grande, and he starts shifting his troops around, massing his troops along the Rio Grande to create the impression that they're going to go across and attack the Maximilian regime. He's trying to wage this psychological warfare to spook the conservatives into backing away from the border, which will allow the liberals then to claim northern Mexico. He sends scouts over within Mexico to look for sources of forage and food and to make contact with liberal guerrillas. And 
he sends emissaries to meet with Juarez. And he makes sure that people understand this is going on, all to try to undermine the conservative regime. And he believed, as of the middle of 1865, that he was on the verge of toppling the conservative regime in Mexico. So what happened? Well, what happened is William H. Seward recovers. And he comes back into the cabinet, convenes a cabinet meeting, and outmaneuvers Grant. Grant makes a special pitch to the cabinet saying, look, this is really our fight down there and we need to be involved. And after Grant's done, Seward gets up and says, we've had enough dead people for a while. And he also points out the fact that almost all the American troops in the Union Army were volunteers and they wanted to go home. And that becomes the US policy. Uh, the Union Army was a bit over a million men. 900,000 of them are discharged by December of 1865. So the army that, that Juarez and Grant had thought could be used in Mexico has dissolved. And what you have here is a cartoon that shows just how influential Seward is. Seward is behind the throne. This is an anti-Andrew Johnson cartoon. Johnson is on the throne. Seward is behind hand. And he's shown directing the uh, execution of radical Republican leaders. So that, that's a negative fantasy, obviously. Grant thinks, OK. We don't have the Union Army to be involved, but there are going to be a lot of discharged soldiers that don't really want to go home, so we'll create this volunteer force that will go over uh, and be paid by the Mexicans, and they'll go over. And he puts this man in charge of it, General John Schofield. But a, and Romero thinks, this is great, gives $100,000 to Schofield, and thinks, OK, victory's on its way. Underestimate Seward. Seward finds out about this, invites Schofield to Seward's summer home on the coast of New Jersey, plies him with wine, charm, flattery, and says, you know how you can really solve this problem? It's not by going and fighting in dusty Mexico. It's by going as my representative to Paris and drink champagne with Napoleon there. And Schofield thought about this and thought, yeah, that seems like a lot better idea. <laughs> So he tells Grant and Romero, sorry, deal is off. Uh, they're obviously very frustrated by this. Uh, Seward is extremely proud of himself. And he also delays Schofield's departure for Paris repeatedly. So he only actually leaves in, in late November and only gets there in early December. And then the American ambassador in Paris delays setting up an interview with Napoleon so that Schofield never actually talks directly to Napoleon. He's just been sidelined. And Seward boasts of this, that he has frustrated what he calls Grant's wild scheme. Grant and Romero turn to another Union general, Lou Wallace, the author of Ben-Hur. Now, Lou is uh, somebody who had served in Mexico in the Mexican War, just as Grant had, also haunted by it, more of a romantic figure. This is what his wife Susan Wallace says, the long-suffering wife Susan Wallace, uh, that he's obsessed with Mexico. The problem for Lou Wallace is there weren't, he, he, he vowed that he would raise 10,000 men. He's able to raise maybe about 300. There just weren't that many Americans with Mexico written on their heart. But then Grant and Sheridan come up with a different scheme, which is to take US Army rifles, there were a lot of them left over after the Civil War, take them to the banks of the Rio Grande, leave them unguarded, and send word across the river to liberal guerrillas that there happened to be 30,000 rifles new issue American rifles that are at this particular spot. And then at night, the liberal guerrillas would come all across the Rio Grande and grab all this weaponry. And it suffices that it makes the liberal forces in Mexico, uh, including this man, he's wearing a red vest, which is a symbol of being 
part of being part of the liberal forces, uh, better armed than Maximilian's army is, Maximilian's conservatives. And meanwhile, Napoleon has gotten spooked because Sh um, Seward has been playing this good cop routine. He's basically said through his ambassador to Napoleon, look, I don't want war, but you don't know what I'm dealing with with this Grant guy. And, and this Grant guy in Sheridan, I don't know how much longer I can control him. So maybe the best plan is for you to figure out an evacuation plan, which is what Napoleon decides to do, not just because of what Seward's saying or what Grant and Sheridan are posturing, but also because he's got this German problem, <laughs> which is the Prussians are uh, increasingly posing a threat to France. So Napoleon realizes he can't afford to have 50,000 French troops on the other side of the Atlantic. The evacuation starts, it will be com completed in March of 1867. Maximilian foolishly stays in Mexico, and he decides with the conservative forces, Mexican forces, he's going to hold out at a place called Cuerotero. Well, this is how it works out for Maximilian. Uh, he will be betrayed by one of his officers, uh, the liberal army will sweep in, will capture him, and he's then, in June of 1867, is shot along with two conservative generals. Now, this is a painting by Edouard Manet. And if you look at the painting, there's something that doesn't quite fit here. And that's the uniforms of the soldiers doing the shooting. Those are not Mexican liberal forces. They're French troops. This is a commentary by Manet saying that, you know who killed Maximilian? It's the French. It's the French that put him in this situation, deluded him, created this fiasco. So if you want to blame somebody for the death of Maximilian, do not blame the Mexicans. Blame the French. Juarez gets into Mexico City. This is the triumphal arch that's erected for him in June of 1867. And then the coda to all of this is in the fall of 1869, this man goes to Mexico, William Seward. And the president is Juarez. His foreign minister now is Matias Romero. And they pull out all the stops to welcome Seward and treat him as an honored guest. And the two sides will tell very pretty lies about what the history has been. And Seward will do this victory lap and say, in effect, it was our policy all along to show solidarity with the republics of Latin America. Now, Seward does play a part, but it's a very belated part and a very complicated story that I've told. But in concluding with this particular episode, it's to make the point that Mexico has restored its independence, has restored its Republican government, restored liberal principles, but it has not done so in a continent in which it is an equal with the United States, but it's done so in a continent where the United States has, because of its own victory in the Civil War, become the dominant power that a Mexican government had to reassure and welcome American investment. So the triumph of liberalism in Mexico in the late 19th century is not one without its complications. Thank you. Second, Bob, they're going to Come bring in. this to you so we can hear you. Uh, Alan, you do know Matthew Murray's history with the APS? Um, I'm
I'm not surprised he would have a history of the APS because he was a very leading oceanographer and geographer. He is one of only two members of the APS who were ever expelled. Okay. Uh, and, and he was expelled was from other? membership <laughs> when he joined the Confederacy. Okay. Well, the APS is high standard. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Gentleman back. So Seward went to Mexico in, yes. in 1869. In 1869. Yeah. Grant was president, though. Yeah, because when Grant becomes president, there's one person he does not want as Secretary of State anymore, and that's Seward. So he sent him as a private citizen? No, he didn't send him at all. Oh. He go, he go, he, as a private citizen, he, Seward can go where he wants to. He's not there in an official visit. He's there as a tourist. All right, but Seward's a kind of distinctive tourist. Thank you. You're welcome. Michelle. Sorry, what happened to Maximilian's wife? Oh, that's a tragic story. Um, so so um, when the French troops are withdrawn, Maximilian and Carlotta agreed that Carlotta is going to go to France and make a last-ditch effort to persuade Napoleon to change his mind. She goes there, and Napoleon does not change his mind. So she decides she's going to go to the Vatican to try to get the Pope involved in this. She is um, deeply, deeply frustrated and in despair, and she loses control of her reason. So the Pope has this great quote. He says, I've suffered so much as Pope, and now I have a woman going mad in the Vatican. <laughs> so she never recovers her sanity. <laughs> And she never goes back to Mexico. And she will live long enough. Um, she's, she's originally from Belgium. And she goes back to Belgium. And she has the misfortune of being there when World War I breaks out. Right. Uh, so she's, you know, she continues to think this rag doll is Maximilian that she has. Um, but she says the kind of things that are surprisingly lucid for a crazy person. She's basically saying when the bombs are dropped not too far from her refuge, from, from a German airplane, um, to, to the effect that it's all over. It's madness. This is what the world's come to. So um, the, that Carlotta leaves is part of the reason why Maximilian's <coughs> decisions are not rational ones himself without her advice. Bob? Dr. Taylor, can you talk about the relationship, um, the um, relationship between um, the United States and Mexico uh, after the, the conquest of Mexico? It seems that yeah. they wouldn't be, there wouldn't be any kind of uh, mutual ground between. Right. Well, what, what happens during the 1850s is you, you have a succession of democratic administrations. The Democratic Party then was a very different party. It's, it's, it's the, of the two parties, the one most committed to white supremacy, to expansion of the United States using violent means. So that doesn't end with the Mexican War. So under the, the Polk administration, and, um, and then you've got uh, Pierce, and you've got Buchanan, uh, there's a brief interlude where uh, there is a Whig presidency under Zachary Taylor, very brief, uh, and John Tyler, who's not really a Whig. So their policy is that Mexico is the sick country of North America, and it's going to collapse, and we're going to pick up the rest of the pieces. It's a period of very active what's called filibustering, which is American military adventurers who are intervening in Latin American countries to overthrow them and create republics that are really their own dictatorships as a step toward incorporating them in the United States. So this activity is going on around the Caribbean. It's going on in northern Mexico at this time. Uh, officially, the US government is opposed to this activity. They see it as compromising their own diplomatic efforts to obtain the same end result. But that's the state of American policy. And that's why Romero, when he sees Lincoln gets elected, uh, is, OK, this is a different party. 
different philosophy, this is potentially a new start for U.S.-Mexican relations, and that's why he goes to Springfield. Yes. Dr. Taylor, um, as Americans, I think we get tunnel vision when it comes to the Civil War. Uh, obviously, it's a, a huge event in our history. It sucks in basically the whole entire 19th century. And I think we don't tend to look beyond that until after the Civil War. So I'm wondering, like, what was it that sparked your interest to make this connection? I mean, it obviously it exists. So was there, like, a document or mm -hmm. were you just interested in Romero? Or what was it that kind of motivated you to tell this, this larger right. story? No, I, I, I didn't much know the story. I, I, I knew a little bit the story of Maximilian and the French being involved. But I didn't know about the connection with the U.S. Civil War. I came to do this because I've done a series of books which are looking at U.S. history, but doing it embedded in the whole continent. And had looked at Mexico and, and Canada and the American West and Native peoples uh, in a succession of books. And then I thought, you know, I've always, I'd interested in continuing the story into the era of the Civil War. And that led me to learn about Romero and learn much more about Juarez. Um, given the fact that, af that uh, after Maximilian, the, there was a liberal regime again in Mexico and a Republican one in the United States, did Mexico make any effort to regain the territories that they had lost under the Democratic administration? No, they, that's a complete non-starter, and they know that. Um, it's not like the Just United no States way. is going to give up California. Um, the, the West had become enormously valuable to the United States, and, and a big part of what goes up, and a significant part of what goes on during the Civil War is efforts by the United States to fully integrate the West into the United States, which had not been achieved up until that point. So things like the Homestead Act, Transcontinental Railroad, um, Transcontinental Telegraph, all of these are developments of the Civil War, and it's a conscious effort by the United States to integrate these regions. So uh, Mexico's not getting any of it back. What, what Mexico really wants out of the United States is not more territory back, but to have more American investment capital. Mexico has virtually no railroads. And in the 19th century, almost, people under, anybody trying to run a country understands if you want to have economic development, you need railroads. Uh, so Mexico does not have the capacity to build its own railroads. It needs investment capital. And uh, the Republican Party, part, part of the story is the Republican Party segues from being the party of anti-slavery into being the party of big business. And that's happening during the Civil War. Now, on the other side of the Civil War, the party of big business wants to do business with Mexico because it wants to own a lot of Mexico's resources. And uh, the Juarez administration and then its successor under Porfirio Diaz are on board with that because they, they knew they weren't going to get investment capital out of Europe. After the execution of Maximilian, uh, Euro European powers treat Mexico as a pariah. And uh, Mexico is not paying its debts to European powers because these European powers had used that debt to try to actually to nearly topple Juarez. So Mexico becomes much more connected economically with the United States and ec investment capital from the United States than it ever had been before. So Mexico is independent, but it's not economically independent. Randall, we have time. Oh, we have time. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. oh, Jess, please. My, my question was whether Mexico or any of the people of Mexico had reached out to the Confederate states yes. as, a, as a diplomatic partner. Yeah, there were, uh, in northern Mexico um, in particular, there was a, a guy that we might call a warlord, um, the dowry. And the dowry uh, was which basically carved out an independent regime in the northern states of Mexico, northeastern states of Mexico, and in defiance of Juarez. And he turns to the Confederacy and says, I, I want to do the same thing you're doing. <laughs> How about we make common cause? How about you take in my states as part of the Confederacy? This is, puts the Confederacy in an embarrassing position 
because they know that Napoleon wants to claim Mexico and they're hoping they can get France on board to help the Confederacy and France is going to be more important than Vidaury is. So they reach a commercial deal with Vidaury but they will not take in those states to join the Confederacy. The official position of the Confederacy is we're not expanding anywhere because they need to do that to try to entice the British and the French to intervene in the Civil War. Now, it doesn't work in the end, but it keeps them from making the kind of common cause with Badawi that he had hoped for. Randall, I think you have the last question. Oh, my. Uh, so, fascinating talk, by the way. Um, and it, one of the most interesting things was not only what you said, but something that you didn't say. Uh, Lincoln exits stage right very early in the story. And when we think about the American Civil War, Lincoln just dominates people's thought and discussion. So I'm curious, mm -hmm. while the war is going on, before Lincoln gets assassinated, did he think about this, the Mexican situation in any way? Did he and Seward exchange uh, commentary, mm -hmm. uh, thoughts? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Could we Yeah, I want Lincoln to reassure you, there's plenty of Lincoln in the book. Uh, <laughs> but, but Lincoln basically turns over Lincoln doesn't have a lot of experience in foreign policy. Not that Seward has a great deal, but, but Seward's been in the Senate for a long time. Lincoln's federal career had been quite limited to, I think, just one term in Congress. So Lincoln defers to Seward as long as Seward will ultimately defer to Lincoln's making the big decisions. And the big decision is, do we, what do we do about this intervention in Mexico by Napoleon? And Lincoln's fully on board with what Seward is suggesting, which is we got to stay out of it because we can't afford any more enemies than we currently have. Um, but, but Seward becomes the point person for this policy. Lincoln's not going to be giving speeches about it. It's just that's for Seward to take on. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.